First, thank you for that dance. That was beautiful. Um, I just wanted to thank the Lord because today Pam and I have been married 40 years. And, uh, I'll tell you a quick story. She, uh, she ran uh, cross country in high school and then she ran cross country when she came up here at state. So uh, when I decided I was interested in her, wanted to get to know her, I thought, well, maybe I'll take an interest in running. Even though in college days, I was not a runner. For me to run was to run to the bathroom or to get in the car and run to Bojangles. So. But I showed up at her apartment one day and uh, knocked on her door and asked if she wanted to go for a run. And she took me up on it. And uh, we ran for miles. So we ran, we were near Cameron Village. We ran down Oberlin Street. We ran Peace. We ran, oh, long, long ways. But uh, thank God, she saw I wasn't much of a runner, but, uh, but uh, I've been truly blessed. I do, that's right. So thank you. Or you kept, you, you slowed down for him. Yeah, I figured that. <laughs> thank you, Emma and Abigail. That was awesome. Really was good. You don't have to make us all cry, but anyway. Somebody else? Somebody else? Somebody. Okay. The Lord is good, ain't he? When Jethy and I was in Columbia, Missouri, me and the Lord got into debate. And it was a tie. And so um, I want to I asked the Lord, can I share this with everybody here? So who remembers the Red Sea crossing, Moses and the Israelites? This is what this debate is about. All right, so I want everybody to close your eyes. If you go to sleep, that's fine. David will wake you up. And just imagine we're at the Red Sea. Just put that picture in your head. We're, we're all standing there. And I asked Jesus to be there with us. So he's standing beside me. And you look and you see this vast amount of water. And then behind you see thousands and thousands and thousands of Israelite. And so the Lord says, let me show you my power. So he nodded his head and Moses raised his hands. And the Red Sea started parting. And it was so beautiful. Hundreds of feet high, clear, dry. And then the Lord nodded his head and Moses started having everybody walking. He said, you see how powerful I am, how much I love my children. I said, yes, Lord, I do. So everybody got on the other side. It took three days of walking. And then I said, Lord, I said, you're so powerful. You're so almighty. Why did you not just have a boat come in, take everybody across, or just have angels carry them across? He looked at me. He says, son. I said, oh, Lord, but why do you want them to walk across? You know, but you're all this powerful. He said, well, if you let me finish, I'll tell you. I said, okay. So he says, son, let me tell you this. The reason why I had them walk across the Red Sea is, well, frankly, nobody knew how to swim. <laughs> that would make sense, wouldn't it? <laughs> God. All right. You want to say something? Thank you so much for that dance this morning. Where is she? Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that because that's the heartbeat of the Lord, right? We all go through pain. We all go through um, loss. We all go through so many things in life. We really go through a, a lot that Sometimes we don't want to talk about it, and sometimes we don't want to express it. Sometimes we don't even want to think about it because it hurts so much to even um, think about it. So this week that I really missed, I really missed being in this place. I missed the worship. I missed the message. I missed the people that I know over here. So I want to let you know that I was waiting to come back to, to enjoy all of this again. But to tell you this, what we learned at that conference was some of the things 
FOC is already doing it. There's another part of it that God is just unfolding and he's bringing. But some of the things that we heard over there sounded like so new agey. And our hearts have shut off from the fullness of what God has in his word. We have kept saying, this sounds like the heathens do. I don't want this part. I don't want this part. I don't want this part. So the devil says, okay, you don't want it. I'm going to take it and we are going to run with it. But they don't have the right source that they're running with it. We have the source. We have the universe. He in us and I in him. So the universe in us and we are in the universe. We are the source that God is in and through working. And I want to encourage you this morning and say, this portal that is opened up here is for you to come and encounter him. It's for you to come and see how good he is, how awesome he is, how wonderful he is. What is the trial and the testing that we are going through is not to prove how wonderful and how good we are before the Lord. The trial and the testing is to show how wonderfully and powerfully you have been brought into being by God. He breathed his life into you that you can become one with him and he can become one with you. That is the whole purpose of what we are going through. And what Abigail is going through, she keeps saying, I want to know the truth. And what is the truth? The truth that makes you one with him. I know we feel sorry that she's going through with the daughter. We can pray for her. We can encourage her. And we can do all of that. But above it all, the truth is in all of this, she will become so one with him that when the trials and the testing comes, you are not looking at the trial and the testing. You are looking at this awesome, beautiful, universal, big God. At the end of the story, we are going to be with him. And we are not going to be separated from him. We are going to be with him, with him. And I'm telling you again, the next five years, the 25 to 2025 to 2030, is going to be a very, 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 very challenging times. It could be the seven and a half years of tribulation that we are talking about. But if you don't prepare yourself now for what is going to come ahead, it's going to be very difficult for you to make the choice whether you're going to stand for the Lord or you're not going to stand for the Lord. You don't make a stand for the Lord when you have a problem. You make a stand for the Lord for right now. I keep saying to myself, I don't have family out here. I only have some good friends. And I said, if Johnny goes, Lord, am I going to give up on you? Am I going to like stop serving you and doing what I'm called for? No. I make the decision whether he leaves, he dies. I am going to stand for the Lord. I am purposeful to live for him until I go see him. I am going to run my race. If something happens to my family over there, my commitment is towards the Lord that I am going to honor him because I'm called by him. I'm called for him. I am his. That is the commitment that we live by. And I want to encourage you with that this morning. As she danced with her heart, you know, so vulnerable with the little girl. Thank you for that, Emma. And Emma means healing. So God is releasing that healing and his love over us this morning. You know, it's interesting um, how God orchestrates stuff. Oh, as a side note, one of the things that, that's interesting about um, even if or even though is there's a great word in Hebrew called dienu that we use at um, Passover. That God, if you'd only done this, dienu, it would have been enough. It would have been enough. And I thought about that when you uh, were sharing what you did. It was powerful. Um, 
last week we talked about meditation just a little bit um, and how important meditation is, how vital meditation and what Jothi just shared. I can't tell you how more, even more vital we learn to meditate on God's word. We learn to meditate on what's good and true and um, uh, because it's meditation that will change the way you act. Meditation will change the way you think. It will change the way you think. Now, there's a worldly meditation, of course, and it worked. Amazingly enough. Why? Because they took what God was offering, we got rid of it. Well, for the most part, it was always there. And it works. It works in some ways, but it, it, it doesn't have the staying power that the meditation that God brings us into. And remember, meditation is thinking deeply while talking to yourself. That's just the actual... Hebrew definition, to think deeply while you talk to yourself. Well, who are you talking to? As you meditate, you ask God how, what, where, how, when. And it's so very important um, that, and we'll, we'll look at this further down the road, I'm going to be on this for a while, that ways to meditate on God's word, ways that will, in other words, learning the ways of God in Psalm 2 when David said, I meditate on your instructions. He didn't have scrolls out there and when he was looking at the sheep. He meditated on God's ways. And if you look at the Psalms, you realize that out of his meditation came all of this revelation. But probably even more important than that, out of his meditation came an intimacy with God that God so long sworn desires. God said, David is a man after my own heart. And why? Because that's what God wants. God wants intimacy. He wants more than a guy came on Tuesday night it was really kind of interesting and he um, he said he God took him through 12 years of purging he'd been out preaching and had a very successful ministry what he thought quote was successful and um, he would be preaching hard and to prisoners and to different places where he'd go and his message was just fire brimstone and he says all these people were buying, buying fire insurance they basically didn't want to go to hell. So they were buying fire insurance. They weren't getting saved. They were just buying fire insurance. And he said that God took him through 12 years of this purge until he came to a place where he began to realize, wait a minute, I need to be expressing God's heart. It was amazing because everything he shared was like, wow, okay, this is what we want to do. Um, he says to share the Father's heart to begin to tell people that God loves them. You know, it's the goodness of God that brings us to repentance. And you know, when we you know, if you preach sin enough, it will bear fruit. Um, if you preach love enough and grace and all that, it bears fruit. I think I'd rather have that ultimately the interesting thing to me is in what we have set aside what we have lost in the process of communicating with God is many times we kind of settle into the fire insurance world where well I'm saved and that's good now I'll go on my way and have my thing. Oh, I'll read my Bible once in a while. I'll throw up prayers to God here and there. And 
That's not the kind of relationship God desires. You might be his child, but you're more like a but you're acting more like an orphan. And I don't say that in a bad way, but instead of a true child who has parents. Now an orphan who's adopted has parents. We're all orphans that were adopted. We were actually adopted into the Jews were not. They were part of the branch. We were grafted in later. Thing, the words that have come up several times today is imagination. The most important aspect of meditation is learning to use your imagination. And, you know, when we first hear that, first time I ever heard that, I thought, no, that sounds squirrely, you know, because we've been taught so much that imagination is not a good thing. You wouldn't have had the dance you had this morning if it wasn't for imagination. It wouldn't have been there. You wouldn't have some of the... Look at Bach, who was a spirit-filled Christian who he said, I write my songs and I perform to the glory of God. And it's interesting because many times in Israel they'll listen to Bach and there's just this air of peace when they listen to Bach and they don't even realize why. Because what's coming out of that music is a creation that God imparted to him. Through his imagination. Sure, he was talented. But it takes that imagination to produce all of that. Now, and, um, did I give you Genesis 6, 8? Uh, six five, I mean. Put that up. The Lord saw that the wickedness, depravity of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination or intent of their thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Now it's interesting that he said he looks at them and he says, All the imaginations of their heart have become wicked as if their imaginations to begin with would have been rich and beautiful and good. Right? I mean, if you think about that, because so many people read that, oh, imagination, it, it, it comes out of wickedness. No, that's where it goes. But our imagination is a, is a creative organ of our spirit. We don't realize that in many ways. But imagination, to imagine God. <coughs> imagination is a creative organ of our soul. It's a gift from God. I mean, think about God's imagination. If we're created in the image of God, I want you to think about God's imagination. If we're created in his image, wouldn't he have imparted to us the same, an imagination? We create stuff. We're the created creators. Animals can't create stuff, but we do. And if you don't think God has imagination, look in the mirror. Hmm. Or look at these crazy little bugs or birds or that, that are unbelievable. I mean, I can imagine God up there going, oh, this would be perfect. And he creates this and he creates that. You know, when he created the birds on that day, he said, oh, let the, these birds fly around and blah, blah, blah. No. He had already imagined what they looked like. He had created them in himself when he said, let these birds fly out. And butterflies, oh my God. Right? And we were looking at, we've got a little feeder for um, hummingbirds down in the garden. We were watching them come in and feed. And 
John was telling me, I guess this is true, that hummingbirds along about October all fly to Mexico. They all go down there. Who, who told them to do that? Well, evolution, of course. You know, they evolved into that. Who told them how to find that little thing and drink from it? How did they know to come to that and drink out of it? Now, what was interesting, I think it's, um, uh, I think it's here. Let me look. In Isaiah, I didn't put this up, in Isaiah eleven twenty six, Isaiah says, Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things? Now, the people of Israel were involved in worshiping idols, and their imagination was stullied, stullied because they're worshiping idols. And he tells them, look up. Look up and look at all of nature. Well, we just did for a minute. Some of you were imagining these beautiful creations. Look up. And, and do you ever just do that? Not just because it's beautiful, but imagine the God of heaven and his creation. That's imagining to the place that you see God. Well, that's what Paul said, wasn't it, in Romans? That God put himself into all of creation? <clears throat> when we constantly invalidate our imagination when we're awake... God opens our eyes while we're sleeping. Do you know why you dream? <coughs> Many times when God, God's always speaking to you and always, always speaking to you. And if you wonder why you're not necessarily listening or, or anything else, are you using meditation, imagination to bring these things in where you can see and hear God? Our Western culture has so invalidated. That's why even in these scriptures, there's, there's the one I brought up last week was um, Isaiah uh, 26, 3, where it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose imagination is stayed on you. Now, in the translators, and I looked through bunches, of, there are a couple of them, more the modern translations who actually translated it right because the Hebrew word is yes sir and it has no definition of mind it has imagination did you find one what is that right whose mind see they use mind they, they can't get away from yes sir is imagination that's its definition now um, Oswald Chambers did that. He, I don't know what translation he used. The RV, what was the RV? Marginal. That was the translation he used. Revised version, I think, is what it's called. There is a revised version, but it's, it's a different than the revised standard version. But he says, I will keep him in perfect peace whose imagination is stayed on you. And this is what he says, and I, I really love it. The test of spiritual concentration is bringing the imagination into captivity. Is your imagination looking on the face of an idol? Is the idol yourself, your work, your conception of what a worker should be, 
your experience of salvation and sanctification, then your imagination of God is starved. And when you're up against difficulties, you have no power. You can only endure in darkness. If your imagination is starved, do not look back to your own experience. It is God who you need. Go right out of yourself, away from the face of idols, away from everything that has been starving your imagination. Rouse yourself, take the gib that Isaiah gave the people, and deliberately turn your imagination to God. One of the reasons that we're stullified in prayer is that there is no imagination, no power of putting ourselves deliberately before God. You know, there's two good, there's two really good books out there. One is Imagine Heaven, one is Imagine the God of Heaven. I've just started the God of Heaven one. But in Imagine Heaven, it, it's this guy who wrote, who started studying uh, near death experiences. And he became a believer and a pastor as a result of doing it. But he studied all, thousands and thousands and thousands of, of near death experiences. What is it? One in five, Jeff, in the, in the world have had a near death experience? But one, in 20. one in 20 people in the world have had a near death experience. And so many of them don't share because some of the ones that did were, were you know, like this, this is ridiculous. But if you look at all of these that he wrote, he said thousands, and all of them, all of them say pretty much the same thing of who they meet, what the city looks like, all the different variations of things that they, that they go through. Now, why is it that we have to die to see that? Why don't we imagine that now? Why don't we imagine the God of heaven? You see, immediately you start thinking, that's pretend. Listen, when you come into a place with God and begin to imagine him through nature, through whatever, through the word of God, whatever it may be, you are seeing God. You are encountering the God of heaven. But there's something inside you that keeps saying, Oh, honey, that's just your imagination. You know, children see God. Children, of course, see a lot of other things. But they see, it, working with children and youth, they get it just like this. Because they haven't gone through all of the schooling and everything that convinces you that your imagination is not good. Don't go there. And then the world that picks up on meditation and imagination and visualization and guided imagery, all the things that were God's, they start using them, but they use them in a different context. You know, it's interesting about, there was a, a lady, she was a, um, a high um, witch in the, in the Wicca movement. You probably heard me tell this recently. I, I was telling somebody. But she got saved. It was a huge deal. She got saved. And she started going to church with these people. And after a while, they said, because they, the, in, in the Wicca church, they have worship services and everything else. But she, they said, what is, asked her, what is the difference between what you were involved in and being here with us in church? She says, there's only one difference. Here, the power is clean. Isn't that interesting? Wasn't any difference except the power was clean. Of course, she probably later on realized, too, that the power was more powerful also, all-powerful. In Ephesians 1.18... And, you know, sometimes you might think, well, I just don't have, I've, I've had people tell me, I just don't have an imagination. Uh, and, and they've lost it. Honestly, they've lost it somewhere. But Ephesians 1.18 says, I pray also that the eyes of your 
understanding, the eyes of your heart, the eyes of your imagination. Now, some of them actually really do. I think the Amplified puts it in there, doesn't it? Or is it the Amplified Classic that does it? The Classic's the one that uses it. I pray also that the eyes of your imagination may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. You know, Abigail, I don't know if she knew at the time she was using her imagination and meditation that brought her into what, into the place that she did where she could have hope. Because had she not been, she probably would have broken totally under the midst of that, even though it was very, very difficult. But I think, too, what Jothi's talking about in that, all right, so the next five years, maybe tribute, well, who knows what, what could take place in this world because it's on the brink of a lot of things. Um, but we're going to have to go through stuff. There's nowhere that says we're going to be taken out of the tribulation. It says we will be cut short because of the elect. But we aren't going to be taken out. So if you've been laying back on your laurels thinking, oh, I ain't got to worry about nothing, you know, I'm going to get snatched out of here, so what? No, you better be prepared for the fact that you may be in a concentration camp. You may lose, you know, in Hebrews it talked about how they gladly lost all of their property and everything else. They were taken off to prisons or, or it was just confiscated in some way or other. meditation on the word of God more than anything else meditation on God's word not memorization memorization's okay if then you'll take and meditate on it you know I find that when I sit down and read like two or three chapters I get up from that and I don't always remember what I read. And I, I tend to be a little ADD, so my mind wanders anyway. But, but if I catch one thing, I'll meditate on it. And I'll let it grow. And I'll imagine. You know, the songs that we sang today, they have a lot of feeling. Um, but it, it, like the one, I, and I love the one we sing, All My Life You Have Been Faithful. Does your imagination soar into the world of, of, of the things that you've seen the faithfulness of God in? That brings you into worship. When you begin to imagine what you're seeing in those words, it will bring you into a place of worship. I, I, some of the great hymns that we hardly ever sing anymore um, had such a depth of that in them. Uh, crown him with many crowns. Can you imagine all of heaven gathered together, the saints and all of us gathered together as they come and they crown him the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The pageant, pageantry far exceeding that of England's little kingy thing far exceeding anything you could ever imagine. There you go. Can you imagine those kind of things? That kind of imagination will take you from No, crown him with many crowns. Go and read Revelations 4 and 5 when they're celebrating the Lamb of God. It's a great celebration in heaven when all, somebody calls out and they says, you know, we don't have anybody to open the scrolls. Who can open these scrolls? I've imagined that so many times, seeing all of heaven, and they're worried. Nobody, there's no one here to open the scrolls. And finally someone calls out, the Lamb! The Lamb can open the scrolls. 
because it, it, it's the rest of all of history. Open in those seven seals, the Lamb. And all of heaven begins to rejoice of the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah. Isn't it amazing? He's a lamb. He's a lion. He's a king. He's our Lord. I just want to comment on the fact that we were talking about children, that they're, they're not bombarded with the world yet. So they do have great imaginations. And I believe they see things that we can't see. And um, as an example, um, my our eldest son, Jerry, and his wife, Cindy, uh, they lived in New Jersey. And uh, Jerry, 13 years ago, went home to be with the Lord. And it was a very difficult time. But Cindy, my daughter-in-law, Cindy, told me one time, she was at that time living with her daughter in Pennsylvania. And their youngest, her daughter's youngest child that probably wasn't even five yet. Um, and, you know, my son, our son had passed before that, so she never saw him. But she, Cindy said she was out on the deck and she saw Leah, the little one. She was out by the swings and she's pushing the swing, nobody's on the swing. She's pushing the swing and she's saying, go Jerry, go Jerry. She, and then, you know, then eventually she said, okay, Jerry, it's my turn. She went to get on the swing. But that's, you know, that really touched my heart. Mm -hmm that I know, I believe, I believe he was there with her. Amen to that, Joyce. Thank you. I'm, I'm kind of beaten on this thing because I want it, you know, you've got, we've, we've got so much stuff that has cluttered the way for us to really release our imagination before God and let him speak to us let us see God let us understand things um, that it, it's almost needful and, and I encourage you to allow him Ephesians 1.18 to open the eyes of your imagination so that you can see, hear and understand if, if you don't have an imagination or if you've kind of lost it or you've, you've let it go by the wayside or you thought it was evil, because we can have, listen, I get some pretty weird imaginations sometimes that aren't so godly, and I have to kind of go, oh, no, 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 no. You're not, you're not edging your way into to my world. And sometimes I get deep into them before I realize, you know, what I'm imagining, I, nah, 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 nah. you can't, you can't go there. Um, for one thing, <clears throat> well, you just can't. Don't. Amen. You know, um, because it, it's a path that has, a, always has a dark ending. Ultimately, um, you know, even, <clears throat> and if you, if you don't get used to stopping those bad imaginations 
it'll be very difficult for you to have rich and good imaginations. God, God put that imagination in you, and he's trying to talk to you through it. Let me just say a couple more things. Is the imagination dangerous? Well, if it's used, uh, let's put it this way. There's no reason for it to be or for you to be afraid if you're pursuing God. If you're using your imagination to pursue God, put your imagination on God. You're not going to get into dangerous territory. He won't give you a serpent or a snake or a scorpion, right? That's what he says in in Luke 11. Um, It is true that there are scorpions and snakes in the world of the evil imagination, but when we are pursuing God in the Word through the imagination, it would be an insult to the nature of God to be afraid that you're going to receive something dangerous. God is big enough to protect us, and we need not fear. This fear of the imagination stems from a weak view of God and an inaccurate view of the devil. God wants us to enter in, and he will protect us when we do. Father, I pray that the eyes of our imaginations would be enlightened powerfully. Even more so, Father. Even more so. Maybe some have just, just are bathing in that. Well, Lord, just open it more. I just say more. That we might see you. And Lord, lock that in as we meditate on your word. As we meditate on things that are good and true and lovely and wonderful. As we meditate on your world, that we would see your face. That, Father, it would grow deep within us. That we would be able to face anything that may come our way. Anything. want to speak to the comfort that comes from this